Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Adam White, and I'm the director of the C. Boyd and Gray Center for the Study of the Administrative State here at George Mason University's Antonin Scalia Law School. And it's my honor and pleasure to welcome you all here today for a wide-ranging discussion on the question of OIRA, White House Regulatory Oversight, and the Future of Cost-Benefit Analysis. Now, at nearly 40 years old, the White House Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs is by now a well-known uh, and respected institution in federal government. I certainly don't need to tell that to the folks in this audience. Uh, but of course, against the sweep of American history, a 40-year-old institution is still pretty young. And so we thought it would be worthwhile to begin the year with a look at that institution, its past, its present, and its possible futures. And we brought together a variety of scholars to write papers on OIRA and cost-benefit analysis and the courts. Now these papers were discussed in an earlier form at a private workshop uh, last spring. And it's a real pleasure to bring everybody back together again for a public presentation of these papers and using these papers, as we always do at these conferences, as jumping off points for broader discussions. Now, all of these papers that we'll discuss today are available on the Gray Center's website, both on the web page for this particular event and also on our uh, larger Working Papers series website uh, where we list all of the papers that the Gray Center has helped to incubate over its five-year history. Now the first discussion is focusing on uh, OIRA specifically and asking what role should OIRA play in government. Really could not have thought of four better panelists to speak on this issue. I'll introduce each of them as it's his or her turn to speak. We'll begin this morning with Susan Dudley. Susan served as OIRA administrator from 2006 to 2009. Today she directs George Washington University's Regulatory Studies Center, and she's a, she is a distinguished professor of practice at George Washington University's Trachtenberg School of Public Policy and Public Administration. For today's conference, she wrote a paper titled, OIRA, Past and Future. Thanks, Susan. Hopefully it the slides up. Well, um, thank you, Adam and Leah, um, and the Center for um, the Gray Center for bringing these people together and getting us to write papers. I'm looking forward to the to the discussion today. Sorry. What can you hear me if I step away from the mic for a second? Um, what I plan to do is kind of give you a history, so set the stage for what's coming by just reviewing um, the history of White House regulatory oversight. Um, so, let me begin. So, the y-axis somehow shows up when I look at it on my screen, but it doesn't show up there. It's, that's number of pages in the Federal Register by year um, from 1940 to last year. And um, I use this just to think a little bit about what were some of the most significant milestones. So, the first regulatory agencies were in the late 1900s, uh, or late, yes, 18, late 19th century. Um, and so by um, the 40s, there was a concern about the fourth branch. People didn't talk about the administrative state then. It was the fourth branch, um, this unaccountable, unelected fourth branch. And the Administrative Procedure Act of 1946, of course, um, did, um, created procedures um, and practices that ensured that regulations would get public comment um, and would be consistent with statutory authority. And then in the 1960s, late 1960s, there was an increasing concern that the regulations that were prevalent at the time were um, actually harming, that were the economic forms of regulation were harming consumers by keeping prices high and protecting the regulated parties that they were getting captured. Um, and so as a result of that, we actually saw some removal of the economic, a lot of the economic regulations at the time. And that was bipartisan. Um, it was all three branches of government were involved in, in that removal. But at the same time, as you can see from these number of pages in the Federal Register, there was something else going on. I have fun with my students asking them to guess what was going on then. And then I always surprise them first with the economic regulation story. Um, it was the creation of this new type of regulatory agency, the Environment, Safety, and Health Regulations. And as a result of this, while there had been consensus that the economic forms of regulation setting prices or limiting prices and quantity um, 
were just not helpful and were limiting competition, the best thing to do was get rid of them. With this new form of regulation, we, there was recognition that we needed some form of regulation, but that the cost might be higher than the benefits. So starting with President Nixon um, and the, his quality of life review, he required regulations, some regulations, to be reviewed by OMB before they were published. <clears throat> Um, President Ford built upon that. He had two executive orders requiring um, inflation impact statements, and um, which he later called economic impact statements. But as you can see, the, the concern right then was inflation. And also the Council of Wage and Price Stability. He signed a law that um, created that entity. And one part of that, you know, there was one part that was focused on price controls, et cetera, to keep um, um, reduce inflation, but the other was given the authority to intervene um, on behalf of concerns about inflation and economic efficiency on agency rulemaking. So the Council on Wage and Price Stability, or COWPS, had a, a small staff of economists who filed comments, or they called them filings, public filings, on the public record during the notice and comment period. And then President Carter, when he came, he got rid of the quality of life review, but he did maintain the, um, the Council on Wage and Price Stability's role. And he also continued OMB's role in reviewing regulations. And his executive order, for the first time, talked about um, you, looking at the effects, the impacts, improving regulatory outcomes, and choosing alternatives that were the least burdensome. So we were seeing this cost and benefit notion then. Um, President Reagan, of course, and we're going to hear a lot more about his executive order today. Um, oh, I should first mention that President Carter signed the Paperwork Reduction Act, as well as the Regulatory Flexibility Act, and the PRA created OIRA. So um, he did that at the end of his term. So when Reagan came in, he had this um, required this statutory authority to create this new office and he gave it not only responsibility for reviewing information collections but also um, regulations and he brought together that the OMB staff that had been doing the transactional reviews of regulation and that CAUP staff of economists that had been analyzing the economic impacts of regulations and the um, those two groups formed this new Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. <clears throat> um, then um, President Clinton, <coughs> excuse me, President Clinton um, <clears throat> issued executive order. Oh, thanks, Adam. <clears throat> it's easy to say. <laughs> Sally will tell us more about this, but um, Executive Order 12866, which um, maintained the requirements for review. It's, it softened the rhetoric, certainly, from Reagan's. Um, maintained the requirements for review, um, including the focus on um, looking at benefits and costs and understanding what the net benefits were. That executive order remarkably still exists today. Um, President Obama um, issued two executive orders that reinforced and supplemented it. Um, President Trump, of course, has come in with executive orders um, focusing on a cost cap, but he's done that without eliminating or, um, or modifying um, Executive Order 12866. So that's what I want to do for the rest of my time, which is probably getting very short, is just to marvel at the, um, the longevity and the durability of o the OIRA authority. So the procedures have you know, OIRA itself has survived six presidents, um, and Executive Order 12866 has <clears throat> survived four of them and has been in place for 26 years now. Um, and the regulatory analysis that underlies it, the focus on improving economic efficiency and understanding what the net effect of regulations are, that is, is even longer because it goes back to the Nixon Ford and Carter days. And I think I mentioned earlier, the focus is on understanding alternatives, um, alternative approaches, and maximizing net benefits as opposed to outright deregulation um, as the focus on the economic deregulation had been. So I know, especially looking at the um, 
knowledgeable people in the audience, this is probably not new information for most of you. Let me just quickly go through OIRA's roles. Um, first is that voice for economic efficiency, what President Obama called um, providing an analytical and um, a dispassionate and analytical second opinion on agency role makings. And that's valuable to counter the tunnel vision and the interest group pressures that each individual agency sees. Um, and that economic analysis involves why, why do we need to regulate, why is this so a problem that needs to be solved by government? These are all things that are in Executive Order 12866. What are alternatives to achieving that? What are the benefits, what are the costs, and who pays the benefits, and who receives the costs? Um, second, it um, it coordinates across the government, and this is a very valuable role. Um, as, especially as the government at the executive branch gets so large with so many different agencies with st different statutory authorities and different interest pressures, having that coordinator is valuable. Cass Sunstein, in fact, has emphasized that role almost above others, calling it a convener and an aggregator of information. <clears throat> Yes, OIRA does listen to people outside the government, but it does it um, with strict disclosure uh, procedures that, I, that I'm happy to talk more about. Um, and it does give people a, a, a second opportunity to weigh in and share their views on what the impacts will be. And finally, but um, last but probably not least, is that it, um, OMB is a, advises the president. So OMB is part, OIRA is, all of OMB is part of the executive office of the president, part of the White House. Um, and having that, um, the ability to collaborate with the White House staff, which of course have the more political perspective, but bringing that career expertise and the institutional knowledge, I think is invaluable. There are still controversies. There are some who really do not like regulatory impact analysis, especially benefit cost analysis. And I just want to emphasize that Benefit, that regulatory analysis is much more than just benefit cost analysis. And I think that's often lost in the criticisms. It's portrayed as a purely quantified and, and monetized two figures. And if you can't monetize something, it won't be measured. Um, that's not true. And as we can see in the judiciary, and I think we're going to hear a lot more about this today, the trends have been to courts expecting and even requiring <sighs> more analysis of what are the impacts going to be. So it's a, a transparent accounting of the good and the bad things that might happen if we go forward with different alternatives. Um, the other criticism is on disclosure. It's a black box or black hole, even worse. And um, we don't know what changes OIRA is making and they're talking to people outside the government. Um, I think we should distinguish between disclosure of external communications and internal deliberations. External communications, I would say OIRA is probably more transparent than most agencies because if you, if, if you have a meeting with OIRA, it's when a regulation is under review and it's not posted on the <coughs> website, the people who attend, et cetera. Um, internal deliberations, I will fight eternally for the fact that that needs to remain deliberative because you need to be able to have government, different government agencies communicating with each other. Um, and I also want to point out what are the alternatives. If you didn't have a WIRA, someone has to do those functions. It will be White House staff who are, um, who won't have those same tra disclosure requirements. So it'll be less less transparent. Um, and also OIRA, the OIRA administrator, it, yes, it makes agencies accountable to the elected president, but also to Congress, because the White House staff that are involved, Congress can't just call them up to testify, whereas the OIRA administrator, if called, um, goes. So in my last 30 seconds, um, what's next for OIRA? Um, my most important point is please don't eliminate Executive Order 12866. I think the fact that it is so bipartisan, it's been so durable, um, any new administration might come in and think, well, I would have done things a little differently and make some, made some slight changes. Um, if you insist, do it with a separate executive order, but don't um, abandon it. It ain't broke, so don't try to fix it. There may be ways to supplement, um, and I won't go into these, maybe independent 
regulatory agencies, um, Congress. Should Congress codify the requirements? Should Congress have its own office, which Will is going to talk to us about later? And we have to work to do a better job of retrospective evaluation. And with that, I will Thanks, Susan. finish. Thanks, Leave my propaganda up there while I do. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I do want to say, uh, before our next speaker takes the podium, uh, as I mentioned, Susan directs uh, George Washington's Regulatory Studies Center. Uh, it's a running theme of today's conference with a variety of scholars from the RSC who have written papers. We're so glad uh, that they're joining us today. And I, as I often say, the single best resource on a week-to-week -week basis for news and updates on what's happening in the agencies is the Regulatory Studies Center's newsletter. Is it on there? Subscribe. Yeah. Send an email there and you can subscribe. Yeah, so uh, I highly, highly recommend it. Thank you. So our next speaker and our next author today is Stuart Shapiro. He is Associate Dean of Faculty for Rutgers University's Bluestein School of Planning and Public Policy. Before that, he served in OIRA for five years, focusing on regulations on labor, health, and social policy. For today's conference, he wrote a paper titled, OIRA's Dual Role and the Future of Cost-Benefit Analysis. Stuart. Thank you. Thank you, Adam, and uh, thanks to the uh, Boyden Center for having me here. It's been a wonderful experience, both the, uh, the seminar in March and being with all of you here today. Um, like Susan, I have OIRA experience. I was there from five years, from 1998 to 2003. Um, and like Susan, I am a big fan and big believer in OIRA uh, and cost-benefit analysis and the role it plays. Um, unlike Susan, I'm a little less sanguine about the future. And my paper uh, addresses that to some degree. Um, Susan outlined the roles uh, that OIRA plays, and uh, I'd like to emphasize two of them, both because I think they are the most critical roles that OIRA plays, and I think they are the most innovative roles. If one goes back 45, 50 years and thinks about what OIRA does that was not done before, it's these two roles that really stand out. One is to ensure that regulations comport with the preferences of the president. Um, they are the president's eyes and ears in supervising agency regulatory activity. Um, and if the president has a particular direction he wants the administrative state to take, it is OIRA that is charged to ensure that to the extent permissible by law, agencies take that direction. Um, they also, as I was talking about with one of the audience members before, are there to ensure really embarrassing things don't happen. Um, and that's part of that role as well. Um, and then second, they are the watchdog for cost-benefit analysis. They are there to ensure an analytical role is played in, uh, in agency decision making. And Susan talked about the components of that. These two missions are not necessarily compatible. They will often be compatible, but they won't always be compatible. There will be times when presidents are in favor of regulations whose costs aren't justified by their benefits, and they may be opposed to ben rules where the costs are justified by the benefits. I want to emphasize, though, that this does not mean that analysis is useless. Often, there is sympathy between presidential direction and the direction of cost-benefit analysis. When there is and when there isn't, cost-benefit analysis can improve regulations within the range of politically acceptable outcomes. Cost-benefit analysis and the fact that agencies have to conduct it can stop some really bad ideas before they ever become public. And they can stop them before OIRA even ever sees them. OIRA's mere presence has an effect at the agencies that, uh, that goes through the agency and sometimes stops proposals at their early stages. Cost-benefit analysis can argue for or against ideas when political preferences are weak. And cost-benefit analysis enhances transparency by forcing agencies to disclose the benefits and costs of their actions. All this to say, I like cost-benefit analysis. And that's why I'm a bit concerned. What had always been a contest between politics and analysis, which when push came to shove was often won by politics, has become a little bit more of a rout in the last two and a half years. The current administration has 
ignored benefits, both in the executive orders that they have put out, which are focused exclusively on costs, and in individual uh, cost-benefit analyses uh, done by agencies. On some occasions, they've neglected to do analysis when it is required. There have been no annual, final annual reports uh, required by Congress on the costs and benefits of federal regulations. There's been one draft report in now almost three years, but no final reports. And the analyses that have been done have been lacking. And lacking not just in the way that ana weak analyses always are. Every administration produces weak analyses. There'll be a paper this afternoon by Seiko and Hahn that reviews uh, analyses across administrations and points out that there are weaknesses that are consistent. Um, this administration's analyses have been so lacking that an odd thing has happened. Groups that historically oppose cost-benefit analysis and decry it have been regularly citing the analysis and the weaknesses in the analysis as, uh, as a reason that agencies have been behaving in an arbitrary and capricious manner. So where does this leave OIRA? OIRA has always been forced to sign off on analyses it doesn't agree with. I'm sure Susan and Sally both have battle scars from that. In my limited time in OIRA, I still uh, occasionally wake up in a cold sweat from some of the battles that were waged. But when this becomes the norm rather than the exception, OIRA can be more fairly characterized as a political entity, exercising political oversight, playing that role, rather than playing the role of watchdog for cost-benefit analysis. So this situation led me to ask the following question. If we care about cost-benefit analysis, and as I said, I do, and OIRA's ability to safeguard it is insufficient, then what alternative institutional arrangements are needed? And Susan alluded to some of them at the end of her talk, and I'll talk about them in a little more detail. Like any good cost-benefit analysis, I looked at three alternatives plus a do-nothing scenario um, for uh, oversight of cost-benefit analysis. Um, and I asked, what are the positives and negatives costs and benefits, although I didn't monetize them, and maybe OIRA would criticize me for that. Um, what are the upsides and downsides of each of these alternatives? And all, I think uh, at least two of them were mentioned by Susan, and some will be discussed in other papers today. Um, one is to have the courts play a more formal role. One advantage of this is we're already moving in that direction. Paul Noe will give a paper on that later today. Uh, the de recent decision in Michigan v. EPA signals that the courts are going to be more willing to look at cost-benefit analysis. But that could be formalized. We could have uh, what some authors have called a super mandate in a law. They're either a weak super mandate that allows agencies to consider costs and benefits. Some of their statutes don't do that right now or a strong super mandate that requires them to do so, and then throws it to the courts to judge whether or not uh, agencies are complying with that. Like I said, we're moving in that direction anyway, and so maybe this makes sense. There are some downsides, however, to judicial oversight. The first is the judges are not economists, and even if required to review economic analyses, it's not the same as OIRA review, where you have trained economists and policy analysts looking over uh, uh, RIAs. Um, you'll have lawyers doing it, and no offense to the many brilliant lawyers in the room. Um, but economics is different than the law. Um, a second concern comes from the experience we've had with NEPA. NEPA requires agencies to do environmental impact statements. And for the first decade or two, courts were very vigilant in forcing agencies to do them and correcting shoddy uh, environmental impact statements. But agencies wised up. They made their imp environmental impact statements more complex, less transparent, uh, and thousands and thousands of pages long. Since that trend has happened, judges have become much more willing to defer to agencies and say, well, you must know what you're doing if they give me a 2,000-page document here. I fear that that's what will happen with cost-benefit analysis if more stringent judicial review is imposed. A second alternative from the other branch of government is a congressional review office. 
The idea of a congressional review office has bounced around a lot over the past several decades. Most recently, Philip Wallach and Kevin Kosar wrote a paper in National Affairs in 2016 that outlines the case for a congressional review office. Um, there are a number of big questions about such an office. Would you do the review concurrent with OIRA review between the proposed and final rule after the rule is final? Uh, how, would you, uh, how would you ensure that agencies care about uh, what Congress has to say, in each, what the office has to say in each of those scenarios? And indeed, such an office would likely would race, face the risk of being political as well. Congress is, of course, inherently a political institution. On the other hand, the Congressional Budget Office and GAO enjoy, even in this day and age, very strong reputations for good objective uh, review. And an office modeled on CBO or GAO or put in one of those agencies may be able to perform an, a, a function. Secondly, as my old boss John Morrell used to say about this proposal, we believe competition is a good thing. So competition and review of regulatory analysis is something that inherently we should think is good. So there are some big positives about congressional review. Finally, you could have an independent office or an office elsewhere in the executive branch, like the Office of Advocacy does for regulatory flexibility analyses. You could have another office elsewhere in the executive branch that reviews cost-benefit analyses. The concern here is why would it be any less subject to the political pressures that OIRA is subject to, um, and an independent office, one outside the executive branch, raises very difficult and tricky constitutional questions about having something outside the control of the three branches playing a role in uh, policy decisions. At the end of the day, I do want to echo Susan's plea not to eliminate 12866. I think it plays an important role uh, in regulatory policy and the political oversight role. I don't want to demean that. The president indeed has the right to influence agency policy. Um, that's important. Um, but I do think it needs supplementing. And of the three alternatives, I think all of them um, are complicated, and after thinking about it a lot, the one that strikes me as the one with the most potential for positive gains is the Congressional Review Office. Thank you. So our, our third speaker today is Sally Katzen. Sally served as OIRA Administrator from 1993 to 1998. She also served as Deputy Director of the National Economic Council, Deputy Assistant to the President for Economic Policy and Deputy Director of the Office of Management and Budget. Today she is the New York University School of Law's Professor of Practice and Distinguished Scholar in Residence, and she's also one of the Gray Center's Distinguished Senior Fellows. Sally. I love being distinguished. Thank you very <laughs> much for uh, inviting me and to join Susan Stewart and Chris, who are three of the most thoughtful and nicest people in our extended OIRA community. I want to comment on both Susan and Stewart's papers, but let me first speak directly to the question originally posed to our panel. What role should OIRA play in the future? What should it do more of? What should it do less of? What's to be its fame or fortune? I haven't a clue. I really don't because I'm caught up with a different a more existential question, and does OIRA have a future? And I think this is a serious question. I would have said that after multiple Democratic and Republican presidents have endorsed its activities, its future would have been secure. Susan has provided a long history as well as a crisp discussion and response to some of its critics. And I should be clear that Susan and I come from very different places on the political spectrum, and yet we agree a surprising amount uh, of time, although we do sometimes place emphasis on different syllables. And if we weren't such good friends, I could quibble about a few of the comments in her paper, but it sort of reminds me of what the musical Hamilton, Who Tells Your Story? They, they have a right to sort of set it forth their way. In any event, after 35 years of bipartisan support, as I say, I would have thought 
that OIRA would go forth being less controversial, more of an institution, treating its success with modesty and generally fading into the background of hot topics in the regulatory world. But unhappily for me, as a staunch supporter of OIRA, at least until now, I agree with Stewart's analysis. Acceptance of OIRA is now in doubt. It has been tarnished, and possibly irremediably so, by the activities of the last two and a half years. There's an element of deja vu here for me. In 1993, when I came into the Clinton administration, the continued existence of OIRA was very much in doubt. Everyone thought that Clinton would reverse 12291 and throw out this institution, and they were surprised when um, he signed 12866. We were able to salvage what was good and important about centralized review and economic analysis to inform decision making. But given the past two and a half years, I believe that its existence is again the subject of controversy. Critics of cost-benefit analysis are having a field day pointing out the flaws or abuses that are countenanced by this administration, and proponents have been relatively silent, finding it difficult to tout OIRA as a source of dispassionate, analytical, second, sound second opinions. Indeed, many conservative supporters of OIRA and CBA have shifted. They like the two for one. They'll talk about the regulatory budget. Is that because that's where the president is signaling his um, direction? Um, or is it that they've given up on cost-benefit analysis? It's not clear. But it is clear, I believe, that OIRA, which is not particularly lovable, is losing many of its former admirers. And I think Stuart put it somewhat more felicitously, but I've never been shy about <laughs> my expressing my views. So to talk about the future of OIRA, I, I want to underscore Susan's point that the role is not one-dimensional. It's not just cost-benefit analysis. And she laid those out with the, the slide here. These are all useful and constructive. So when Stuart talks about proposals or solutions, he is focusing, I want to be clear, he is focusing on additional authorities um, in addition to OIRA, not to replace OIRA. Because I worry that if OIRA were stripped of its CBA review and so perceived as having been put in its place, its effectiveness in carrying out the other functions would be in jeopardy, which would be an unintended consequence. We all know you're supposed to avoid those, if at all possible. So focusing on Stewart's prescriptions for what ails OIRA, I think he's got the choices right. Uh, do nothing or look at these alternative institutional arrangements at the judiciary, the Congress, or elsewhere in the executive branch. It, it makes no sense to me, or apparently to him, uh, to abandon cost-benefit analysis altogether for many of the reasons he identified. Now, the two choices, do nothing uh, or find an alternative, I'm more in the camp of do nothing. And I hope the next election will return us to business as usual, more or less. But there's a good possibility that Trump will be reelected, or even if he is not, as I said earlier, that the dissatisfaction with the Trump O'Ivor will be sufficient to jeopardize its continued existence. So I will heed the call to consider uh, options for a backup plan. Now, of the choices, I am very negative on the judiciary or elsewhere in the executive branch. The courts are, in my opinion, ill-equipped to do much that is meaningful and helpful. Everybody cites business roundtable. See, they got it right there. They did it there, right? Right. Who was the judge authoring the opinion? Doug Ginsburg. Who was he? A former OIRA administrator. Of course he knew what he was doing. 
but there are roughly 150 other federal court of appeals judges and many, if not most, are not schooled in cost-benefit analysis and are chosen for their legal, not their economic competence. Now, I, I agree that when a court opinion like Mass v. U.S. acknowledges or even encourages mandates uh, cost-benefit analysis in regulatory decision-making, this ups the ante for this and other agencies. But as Stewart noted, critiquing or second-guessing an IRA goes well beyond the ability of most judges, and the likely outcome, I believe, with admittedly a few outliers, will be deference, do you hear Chevron? Deference to the agencies, not something that's gonna hold the agency's feet to the fire or correct their less obvious abuses. Moreover, this review is going to be done after the fact, on appeal from a final rule, rather than at the early stages of decision making when cost-benefit analysis has its greatest potential to inform, not just justify, regulatory choices. So correcting an RIA at the end of the process means maybe months, maybe years, wasted, not very efficient. In any event, as Stewart acknowledges, courts can't get into this business on a regular basis unless Congress enacts a super mandate. Now, I've spent enough ink on why that's a really bad idea uh, to try to go there now, but it bears saying explicitly that notwithstanding my general endorsement of what Susan has said in her paper, her call for a super mandate is highly problematic until and unless Congress figures out exactly which authorizing statutes would be overridden and what the authorizing committees think of that in each and every case, an inventory which has not been undertaken despite years of suggesting that it's a prerequisite for any super mandate. So returning to Stu Stewart's choices, I'd also be opposed to creating an additional or competitive entity in the executive branch to carry out OIRA's review. If OIRA cannot stand up for its established analytical principles, which are all embodied in an executive order, or is ignored or overruled by the powers that be when it pushes for adherence to those principles, I cannot imagine how any other entity in the executive branch could do any better. Simply stated, if politics can capture OIRA, it can capture any creature in the executive branch. And I refuse to buy into an independent commission. We have three branches of government. There isn't some fourth branch out there with some independent things doing something with respect to um, uh, pre-floating oversight of executive branch agencies. This leaves <clears throat> a congressional solution, which is slightly bizarre in light of the extremely low esteem in which Congress is held by the American people. Uh, but as Stewart remarked, uh, the legislative agencies, primarily CBO and GAO, have done a fairly good job and have resisted the unrelenting and undisciplined partisan pressure that exerts its influence on Congress itself. Again, the troublesome issue is the timing of this additional review and the scope. OIRA is not privy to all of the data relied on by the agencies in their RIAs, and it does not typically comment on the assumptions or methodologies until it receives the proposed rule and see how the analysis is set forth. <clears throat> it's unlikely, therefore, that a congressional office would have access to the necessary underlying data to conduct its own CBA. Now, it may be late in the day by my standard, but knowing that they are out there uh, to comment on a draft RIA once the proposed rule was published and uh, suggests to me that the agency or and OIRA might take their respective jobs more seriously. 
uh, there was some discussion in Susan's paper about codifying the executive order. She didn't raise that in her opening comments, so I'll save my breath until it becomes a real issue. I thank you for your kind attention. Thanks, Sally. Um, our last panelist is Christopher DeMuth. Uh, Chris served as a WIRA administrator from 1981 to 1984, and later he was president of the American Enterprise Institute from 1986 to 2008. <laughs> Today, he is a distinguished fellow at the Hudson Institute. I don't know if that's a job title or just a general description. Uh, he's also a distinguished senior fellow here at the Gray Center. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Adam. I'm the only person on the panel that's twice distinguished. That's great. Um, uh, Susan Dudley's uh, careful and thoughtful review of the history of White House review under a cost-benefit standard <coughs> uh, is, uh, uh, is a great uh, addition. Uh, she and Stuart uh, Shapiro uh, emphasized the durability over the decades of this major program, uh, although it has no statutory basis and no particular congressional or political constituency. Uh, it seems to me that the durability of the White House review part of that uh, is pretty simple and straightforward. Uh, these programs began in the 1970s. That was the time of the rule-making uh, revolution in American regulatory policy and the uh, enactment of statutes uh, creating many, many new agencies. Uh, regulation back to the New Deal, it was basically management of cartels. Now we had agencies that could uh, impose uh, costs and benefits of 10 scores, hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, all over Washington, uh, operating through informal rulemaking. It was inevitable, I think, that presidents were going to want to be in the loop on these decisions uh, for which they were going to be held politically uh, accountable. Uh, one could make an argument that they were constitutionally required to be in the loop uh, for the faithful enforcement of the laws that the White House review took place through a cost-benefit standard is a more complicated uh, matter. <clears throat> I have thoughts on this, but I think they're uh, more appropriate. I'm doing dual duty uh, today and speaking at the session on regulatory budgeting in the afternoon, uh, and I'm going to save uh, my thoughts on that uh, for then. Let me say, uh, for now, uh, uh, my uh, telegraphic answer is that the cost-benefit test is a constraint, but it is, it is an elastic, capacious constraint. It can be used to uh, counter regulatory agencies' incentives, uh, or it can be used as a mechanism of justification and growth of regulation. Stuart Shapiro emphasizes the dual role of OIRA, to make regulations more efficient and to make them more in sync uh, with the president's uh, political uh, priorities. There's another duality within cost-benefit uh, itself, one that roughly sep separates Democratic and Republican administrations. Uh, the Republicans uh, tend to view it as a mechanism of constraint. Uh, the Democrats tend to review it to uh, regard it as a mechanism of justification and growth, not without exceptions. Uh, you, one can find, uh, but uh, I think that that's a strong uh, tendency. I would like to focus on some criticisms of both Susan and Stewart's paper. Uh, Susan's uh, history uh, is uh, very useful, but uh, a bit too process and procedure oriented uh, for my tastes. Uh, and uh, let me use uh, as an example her brief account of the Obama administration, which seems to me to be much too bland. Uh, this was eight years of the greatest growth of regulation in the history of America. Uh, the Affordable Care Act and the Dodd-Frank Act launched hundreds of new rulemaking procedures, often highly discretionary. That discretion was often used, especially under Dodd-Frank, in ways that were harshly criticized by financial economists of all stripes. OIRA was on the sidelines. OIRA approved the Clean Power Plan, which was flatly unconstitutional. Larry Tribe said so. 
uh, many economists and uh, lawyers who were strongly in favor of greenhouse gas controls, who strongly supported uh, the unsuccessful efforts of Democrats to pass a congressional a congressional uh, program of cap and trade in 2009 and 2010 thought so. The case was clearly in serious constitutional uh, trouble in the Supreme Court and the D.C. Circuit before the Trump people came to town. I've referred to legal excesses, uh, to new statutes and to policies that were clearly uh, favored by the uh, president. Uh, fine, uh, that's uh, uh, all well and good. But it also was a, an era when important precepts of cost-benefit analysis uh, were seriously uh, undermined, in my view. Let me offer two examples. Uh, the one is the issue of co-benefits, which is still uh, very much in uh, debate uh, today. The issue during the Obama administration was not so much co-benefits per se, but the repeated use of one particular uh, 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 co-benefit, uh, which was estimates of the health effects of very low exposures to fine matter particulates uh, derived from a few fairly aged uh, studies uh, with the device of extrapolating from known effects uh, down through in a straight line down through the uh, origin uh, with little or no attention to the enormous uncertainties involved, especially as one approached the uh, origin. But it had the advantage of generating fabulously large benefits, which were used to justify uh, controls in several areas where the primary benefits didn't come close to justifying the costs. Similarly, the administration used private benefits decisively in justifying a host of energy and uh, light bulb appliance efficiency uh, standards. Here, the administration forthrightly used cost-benefit analysis to forbid people from purchasing products for personal use, not because of any externality, not because of any claimed health, safety, environmental, or other public benefit, but just because the government thought that people were making decisions that were uneconomical from their own point of view. OIRA said that was okay. Susan uh, says, while some have expressed dismay that OIRA has done little to slow the growth in new regulation, Demuth, most would agree that its review has focused attention on understanding the effects of regulations, and some have claimed that it has resulted in smarter regulation that produces more benefits than costs, Graham and Sunstein. Um, I, I just want to stick to my guns. I think that... Uh, uh, I think that one has to not just look at whether we've focused attention on regulation uh, and whether some regulations have been better than they otherwise would have been. I think an assessment of the effectiveness of OIRA has to include some aggregate judgment on whether the state of regulatory policy today, whether the effects on national well-being have gotten better or worse in the 39 years that OIRA has been around. I have much to disagree with in uh, Stuart uh, Shapiro's uh, argument, uh, uh, seconded by uh, Sally, that the Trump administration marks a sharp departure, a break with previous administrations, <clears throat> in not only failing to respect, but to actively undermine the integrity of cost-benefit analysis, something that has put the continued existence of OIRA and the entire apparatus of cost-benefit review in mortal uh, danger. Uh, first, he says that the administration has introduced the idea of a regulatory budget and a two-for-one rule, and that its advocacy says nothing about benefits and only about costs. This strikes me as a straightforward uh, confusion. Yes, budgets are about expenditures. Uh, 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 I will have much more to say on this this afternoon. For now, let me say the Federal Highway Administration operates on a budget. It has to conform to a budget, uh, and it's, it makes those expenditures according to estimates of the benefits of one or another highway project. It, it uses cost-benefit analysis. It pays a lot of attention to politics. But I, don't, I have not heard it said, maybe it has been said, that the fact that it uses cost-benefit analysis means that it should be an entitlement with no budget constraint at all. The two are not regarded as inconsistent there. Um, uh, 
Stuart says that the, I, I only have a minute uh, left and I really can't uh, get into this as much as I'd like to. Uh, I, he says that the Trump administration has been singularly uh, political, sloppy, uh, in its uh, application of the cost-benefit uh, test. Uh, much uh, has been much more criticized than any previous uh, administration. The Trump administration's regulatory policies, like much of that it has done, has been, I admit, singularly uh, chaotic. Uh, one can come up with excuses. Uh, there has been a determined resistance effort in Congress to keep the administration from getting staffed up. Uh, that has made a, a difference. but. Uh, even uh, putting that aside, uh, the number of uh, unforced errors and mistakes in regulatory policy have been uh, quite, uh, uh, quite striking. But uh, Stewart's uh, emphasis on the degradation of cost-benefit analysis uh, led me to read through a pretty large sample of regulatory impact analyses in proposed and uh, final rules. And I found nothing like what he claims. I found a perfectly standard range of some uh, clunky, uh, inadequate, kind of not very good uh, cost-benefit analyses. Others that were quite uh, professional, earnest, uh, balanced uh, documents that compared favorably to anything I've seen in previous uh, administrations. Um, it's hard to settle these things uh, very briefly, especially when I have about 30 seconds left. Uh, but let me uh, just mention the first two on his uh, bill of uh, particulars uh, of the uh, dramatic break with the past. Uh, the first is the repeal of the clean energy rule and its replacement by the affordable uh, clean uh, energy uh, rule. Uh, he says that there's a disagree that they're using a different discount rate. That is not a radical departure. Republican administrations are seven percenters. Democratic administrations are three percenters. This is completely within the range of what happened before. They are excluding benefits that are external to the United States. The Obama administration uh, had the costs in the United States, the benefits uh, for the whole globe. That's not an economic question. That is an ethical, political question. President Trump was elected on a platform whose central tenet was that the economic interests of lower income and working class Americans had been ignored by Washington in the pursuit of costly global, global uh, initiatives. It was perfectly proper for EPA to observe that the Clean Air Act is not a foreign aid statute and that it would limit itself to imposing costs on Americans for the benefit of Americans. Co-benefits. It initially criticized the idea of co-benefits. Uh, it said it wasn't going to count them. It was heavily criticized, and it counted them in the final rule. Stewart says this is an example of the administration's uh, uh, not taking uh, seriously cost-benefit analysis. Uh, I don't know why he applies this cynical uh, explanation. You could just as soon have the opposite explanation that this shows that they're responding to criticize doing what Stewart regards as, uh, as uh, the right thing. Uh, he says, well, they're going to be opportunistic because they'll use it sometimes, but they won't use it other times. That remains to be seen. They've set the precedent. They're going to count co-benefits. At the meantime, they've set in place a scientific review process to try to bring some updated information on the health effects of very low levels of fine particulate matter. Why we should say that this is a departure from past, I don't know. Uh, waters of the United States, uh, the cost-benefit analysis was 300 pages long. It seemed to me to be uh, quite uh, careful and uh, well done. Uh, Stewart says that uh, economists describe the assumptions behind Trump's estimate of the costs and benefits of the repeal and replace of the Obama waters of the United States rules as, quote, stunning and equivalent to assuming that pigs could fly. But what he cites is a E and E posting, and neither of the people who uh, said the things that were quoted are economists. One of them is Betsy Sutherland, the longtime EPA official who retired in 2017 with an angry public attack on the administration. The other, a man named John Dorney, is an economic consultant who worked for a long time in the North Carolina uh, Water Pollution uh, Office. Uh, 
I thought it was an excellent cost-benefit analysis of a very difficult question of a jurisdictional change requiring an anticipation of what states would do if we had a uniform national rule that pulled back from what the rule had been in about half the country uh, before that. It is filled with uh, warnings about the uncertainty, the difficulties of estimates. It's looking at what it thinks states are going to do Two states are particularly difficult, North Carolina and Wisconsin. It's one part of this extended uh, analysis. Uh, what it did uh, with those uh, two states seemed reasonable to be. Maybe it was a mistake. We'll see what it does in the final rule. Let me conclude by saying that despite all this, I like Stewart's conclusion that alternative sources of cost-benefit uh, analysis and official judgments on them uh, uh, are in order. I especially like the judiciary uh, and the uh, Congress. Uh, if uh, courts were making decisions as to whether the benefit-cost judgments were uh, reasonable interpretations of the statutes, uh, uh, which the, the courts are clearly moving towards, that will transform OIRA's role within the administration because it will th then not have the final word. As long as it's within the administration, once a decision is made, everybody's going to, to jump into line. But if the decision is then going to be reviewed, the cost-benefit decision uh, by others, uh, that changes the internal dynamics. I think that a congressional regulatory budget office uh, probably will have to await larger reforms in Congress. It might have to be tied to something like a Congressional Review Act of the Reins variety so that this uh, uh, agency is reporting uh, to Congress. Uh, in any event, uh, one of the great uh, changes in, uh, I'm sorry to use the word budgeting, uh, in uh, recent uh, decades has been the emergence of the Congressional Budget Office, which if anything has more prestige and its uh, judgments are looked upon as being uh, less political uh, than those of uh, OMB uh, has been. And I think, that, I think that that's a correct observation. And uh, I think that greater uh, competition uh, in the assessment uh, would be a positive thing. Thank you. Yeah, uh, you can take this one, Susan. So I, I have a couple of questions, and I'm sure members of the audience do. But before we get to those, uh, Susan Stewart, would you like to take a minute to to respond to what's been said so far? All right. Um, yes. Yeah. I. I. This is very interesting. Um, one of the things I think I've heard from all three of my co-panelists is that OIRA. Um, really isn't working the way it should anymore. It's no longer the watchdog, and maybe it's time to abandon it. But um, in response to Stuart and Sally's concern about that happening only in this administration, I think um, the OMB's guidance, OIRA put out guidance on how, what, how to interpret and implement 13771, and it mentions benefits a lot. It, it says this is the budget is an overlay on top of what we do, we are still going to look at net benefits and still make decisions based on that. Um, I think also we should all realize that OIRA's influence is often going to be unseen. Um, OIRA makes things better. Um, can you imagine this administration without OIRA? Without OIRA saying, you know, wait, you, have, you missed this, you missed that. And Chris, I think the same is probably true in the Obama administration. There are battles in every one. Um, I'm sure OMB, OIRA battled with the agencies on the co-benefits, um, the particular matter on private benefits, on the global versus domestic. Um, because OMB guidance says domestic, and you can present global benefits separately if you wish. And that was abandoned in the Obama administration. So I know OIRA has these battles. They're often unseen. But to me, that makes them, it, it doesn't mean they're not valuable. I think they are. And then if I have another minute, on the regulatory budget, which my paper really doesn't look at, although I have something else coming out soon that, that will, I think it's not as incompatible. And Chris talked about this, too, and I would agree with him, as, as many would have us believe with benefit-cost analysis. If ex-ante information that agencies have when they're developing their regulatory impact analyses, if that information were perfect, if agencies' incentives were purely public interest, if they didn't care at all about 
um, their their particular focus, if um, all the public political economy factors weren't there, imposing a regulatory budget would either be not binding because the benefits and costs will always benefits will always exceed costs, or it'll be bad because it'll prevent us from issuing regulations that have net benefits. But those two assumptions that go into that we know are not right. Information is not perfect, and agencies do have incentives to um, characterize the benefits, to, to, make, to make the benefits look as big as they are. Stuart mentioned the EIS, environmental impact statements, and they're getting longer and longer. So are RIAs. They're big, long documents that make it very hard to really understand what were the alternatives, what assumptions went into that, et cetera. So I think we should look at the regulatory budget from a political economy lens and realize that it, it may be valuable for countering the incentives for agencies to use benefit cost analysis as an advocacy tool rather than as a decision tool. Um, we all operate under budgets, as Chris said, and we still maximize net benefits within our budget constraints, and it's no different. I also think that by forcing agencies or providing agencies incentives to look at their existing regulations for the first time, really, um, it may improve benefit cost analysis going forward, and I think that would be great. Sure, great trip. Thank you. And I'd like to thank Chris and Sally for so seriously engaging um, with, uh, with my paper. Um, I think it's probably unrealistic to think that Chris and I will come to agreement on the unique nature of this administration. Um, uh, I do think that it is a step change, and I do want to pick up on one thing he said regarding that, which is that the, uh, the chaotic nature of decision making in the administration, I think that's probably directly related to both what I see as the quality of the cost-benefit analyses and also their very poor record in defending their regulatory initiatives in court. Now, maybe that is changing three years into the administration, and maybe we will see a, a, a very real difference there. But uh, I think everyone does agree that decision-making has been chaotic. There's been a rush to get things out the door and perhaps more attention toward the press release uh, announcing an initiative rather than the, the underlying initiative. Like I said, with replacements of some of the staff at agencies, particularly EPA, that is potentially changing, and uh, maybe the gradient will be upward in terms of the quality of the, uh, the cost-benefit analysis. Um, I do also think, and this was to some degree alluded to in a number of the comments, one has to think about what the purpose of cost-benefit analysis is, and uh, I think it is not deregulation. It may lead to deregulation, but cost-benefit analysis has its roots in utilitarianism, so its purpose is maximizing net benefits. Sometimes that'll mean regulation, sometimes that'll mean deregulation, and I don't think we can judge its effectiveness by uh, the, uh, the extent to which regulations have been stopped or eliminated. Certainly, as I said, um, it stops bad ideas, and I think that's important. I also agree with what Susan just said about how in any administration, I think OIRA has probably played the role of making things better, and that's, I think, one reason to keep it, and that the solutions I propose are supplements rather than substitutes. Great. Um, let me just sneak a couple of quick questions in before we go to the audience. Uh, first, about independent agencies, including the financial regulatory agencies. President Reagan's original executive order um, on regulatory review excluded the independent regulatory commissions. As C. Boyd and Gray explained at the time, um, this was not done on legal grounds, it was done on practical or prudential grounds. Um, just asserting this new authority over executive branch agencies was in and of itself a big first step. Now that we've had OIRA doing this for almost four decades, um, would it be a good thing well, and I'll say in the last in this administration, we saw the the shift towards folding the IRS partly into OIRA. Um, so, would it be a good thing to extend things over at least, say, the SEC and the CFTC, or even over the Federal Reserve's regulatory powers? Sally, <clears throat> this is one of the things on which Susan and I do agree. We wrote a joint uh, op-ed that was in the Wall Street Journal when we did one. To, um, to 286, and we did not extend OIRA review to the independent regulatory commissions, although we 
did expand slightly our jurisdiction with respect to them by asking them to contribute to some of the things that we were doing at the time. That was a modest step. That, like the decision with 12291, was based on political considerations rather than policy considerations. And both Susan and I agree that OIRA review should be extended to the independent regulatory commissions. I think this administration has taken another few baby steps in that direction, and I wouldn't be surprised if there were a second term that they would embrace the independent regulatory commissions wholeheartedly. Sure, Chris. Uh, I'm, I'm for it too. There's a, there's a, a practical problem that the independent commissions are commissions. Their decisions are votes of a group of essentially five people. And so it's not in a single administrator. Uh, so they've issued an NPRM and OIRA doesn't, doesn't like it. Um, are they gonna say that the members of the commission are obliged to vote in a certain way on the final sure. rule if, before they'll let it go to the federal register? Uh, there are some complications uh, in uh, dealing uh, between uh, central administration and a commission which is <clears throat> really a remnant of a very, very different day when these were sort of little mini legislatures outside of the uh, Congress and that will present challenges. Susan, this you wanted to jump in on that? Yeah, this, um, this has been something which Susan and I again have both endorsed, which is to treat it like the PRA, which is to send the decision of OIRA to the agency before its final vote and have it be part of the record so that it yeah. is before the agency when they make their vote. It, yeah. It's doable and it's been done in other contexts. Susan? Um, yeah, I was gonna say that the Paperwork Reduction Act does provide a model and that my colleague Bridget Dooling, who you'll hear from later today, is actually looking deeply at this and thinking about what are the models that OIRA could, that we could use to bring OIRA but bring independent agencies rules under greater oversight because they really do do um, empirically people have looked at it and they don't do as good a job of the analysis and the justification and consideration of alternatives as executive agencies do. All right. I'll, I'll make it unanimous. Uh, well, so, okay, so it's too much agreement. I'm doing a terrible job of this. We're move yeah. on. Let's yeah. move on. Um, <laughs> let's talk about something else. Uh, Susan, you brought up retrospective review. I'd be curious for the other panelists' views on this. What role, if any, should OIRA play in requiring the agencies to look back at old regulations, um, either to just re-examine their own analyses, see what they got right or wrong, or even as a, as a tool towards requiring the repeal of rules that are no longer worth the benefits? You mind if I say something? Yeah, first? sure, go ahead. Just, um, I, I do think every president, going back to Carter's, admit, Carter's executive order, has asked agencies to apply this analysis to existing regulations as well as regulations under development. And yet it hasn't happened, and part of the reason it hasn't happened is that there really aren't incentives there. So you have to do an analysis or you don't get past OIRA. Um, but once your rule is in place, there really isn't that motivation. And so one of the things I'd love to hear my co-panelists talk about is whether President Trump's executive order is making agencies, uh, providing that incentive, because you can't issue something new until you can find some cost offsets from existing regulation. Has that, should that, is that a possible motivator for retrospective review? I'll start and then let Chris and, and Sally go. Um, I mean, I think retrospective review is a good thing. It is a hallmark of good government to go ahead and try and examine how previous decisions functioned. I think uh, Susan mentioned the, uh, the incentives. I think the politics of retrospective review is very difficult in that it doesn't really have a constituency besides us good government types. And in case you haven't noticed, we're not terribly influential. Um, and so, uh, so I do think it is a challenge to figure out how to do it. I do like, and I, I don't remember whether it was Susan that proposed this or someone else, the idea of as part of OIRA review of new regulations requiring a plan for res retrospective review um, of, of regulations to be a part of that initial review um, and to be embedded in the regulation. And perhaps the Paperwork Reduction Act could also be played with to facilitate res retrospective review rather than perhaps serve as a disincentive for it. Yeah. Anyone else? 
Uh, yeah, I would join with uh, Stuart on this, that I think there are a lot of factors, one of which is the availability of data to be able to do a solid retrospective um, review. And there's a bill floating around in the Senate that Susan and I <laughs> both testified on that would say that and when- And another Wall Street Journal op-ed, I think. And another yeah. Wall Street Journal op-ed. We're just in the business of turning <laughs> these out. <clears throat> which says that when an agency proposes um, a rule, it should specify what specific outcomes it's looking at and think about what kind of data it would need to evaluate whether it has reached uh, that goal or is at least moving in that direction, and that that would be part of the final rule, which would be uh, facilitate a review within our lifetime um, of, of going forward. Stewart is also correct the Paperwork Reduction Act has been a bar in some instances to agencies getting the information after the fact. And so I think it's a, it's a variety of um, influences that have kept uh, it from being very productive apart from the fact that a new cabinet or agency secretary uh, or, or agency head wants to move forward and not sort of be looking back. But the point that has to be made again and again is that one of the things that comes from a retrospective review is to test the original ex ante RIA assumptions and methodology. And you can learn when you do a retrospective analysis how to do a better uh, analysis in the next rule, should there ever be another rule. Just, uh, I'll have one last question and we'll go to the audience. Um, given that it is a Scalia Law School, it's worthwhile to pause and think about first principles and the structure of government. Um, you know, the framers in well, Hamilton and Federal Seventy talked about energy in the executive, right, and the importance of, of preserving that energy as opposed to the legislature would be slow and transparent. Um, the, the executive would be swift, sometimes secretive. Um, I guess his exact words were the executive would have decision, activity, secrecy, and dispatch. Dispatch. Dispatch, both in foreign policy, but also he said in domestic policy. And so I guess my question is, um, for all of the extra procedures and standards and transparency that um, we've achieved through things like OIRA, is there any risk or any downside to making the executive branch in some ways act more like a legislature? I mean, is there a risk that OIRA's slow, deliberate nature and the, the transparency that it, it helps foster, that that actually cuts against some of the, the, the principles of energy in the executive? I, I could just put up my first slide again that had the number of pages in the Federal Register and how it's been increasing. Yeah. And so I think there still is plenty of energy there. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, there's concern about ossification, and I think that the f data would belie that. Yeah. I'm not a big transparency man myself. <laughs> and um, uh, I would like to see less transparency in Congress. Yeah. Uh, I would like to see a lot of things done. I'd like. I'd like legislative drafting sessions behind closed doors. I think that would be a big step forward. And uh, one of the things I worry about uh, for people that want to give OIRA a statutory basis in regulation is that the proceduralization uh, will, uh, will, 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 will move uh, further. We'll have more transparency. When I was, trying, when I was preparing, I, I, <coughs> I I find when I go on to Reg Info and the other one, it's actually hard to find the regulatory impact analyses. What you can find is endless emails between OIRA desk officers and people in the agencies over some rule in 2003. You know, <laughs> and um, I'm not. You know, people are really interested in you know, you know. Hi Frank, how are things going? You know, and uh, you know maybe there's something going on here, uh, and uh, uh, so so I'm uh, I'm I'm not for rolling back anything that they've got, uh, but uh, I think that it's I, I think that the uh, that the that the benefits of further transparency I think we're in negative marginal return territory uh, on uh, transparency. 
Well, um, I went longer than I, I expected to, but we still have a few minutes for questions. If you raise your hand, um, a microphone will find you. Now, these are all, by the way, being recorded. They'll be posted on our website, so please identify <laughs> yourself. Uh, we'll start here with Dick Pierce, and then the second one will be in the, in the back. Hi, Richard Pierce, uh, George Washington University. So I had a question for, for Susan. Um, that wonderful first graphic that you put up showed the, the, the significant decline in number of uh, pages in the Federal Register over the last two years. Isn't it the case that if there were real deregulation going on, we would see a significant increase in the number of pages since the Supreme Court held in 1983 unanimously that in order to rescind or amend a rule, you must go through the same. So there would be a massive number of pages devoted to notices of proposed rulemaking and statements of basis and purpose explaining that, and that this is solid evidence that there is little, if any, deregulation, actual deregulation going on. Um, Other than that, I don't have any views on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it, what it's evident, what we've seen, if you look at the you know, statistics over the last few years, which we have a lot on the Regulatory Study Center website, by the way, um, is we've seen a slowdown, a dramatic slowdown in the pace of new regulations, um, less in actual removal of existing regulations for the very reasons that you said. That takes time, you have to develop the record, and it takes, it, you take as many pages and as much time as it is to write a new regulation. So it'll be interesting to see whether 2019 shows an uptick, because it does take a couple of years to get that record right. Great, uh, in the back, there's a microphone. Gladell from, oh. Jonathan Gladell, Policy Navigation Group, but more importantly, I was in OIRA for four years as a career person. It's great to see the panel there. I just want to, as one of the two desk officers that was subpoenaed by Congress as a career official uh, when I was 23 and making a GS-9 or 11 salary at the time, <laughs> uh, the, the idea that if we're concerned about OIRA being political, that Congress is somehow going to be less political uh, bothers me, I guess. I, I think that, that. The other thing I just I would say is we're... For those, and also more objectively than my personal experience, I mean, if you look at the reports that GAO has written about OIRA, Democrat or Republican, I'm not sure we would agree that they were objective reports about OIRA. Um, finally, on just on an analytic basis, while we can say GAO or CBO do a nice job analytically, remember GAO best does that as an audit function looking backwards at what government has spent. And CBO, to the degree it looks forward in terms of what government revenues are going to be or the number of people going to be uninsured, I'm not sure their track record of predicting the future is much better than anyone else's. And when we're talking about a benefit cost analysis, it's not just the number of people that are going to be uninsured, but it's truly the number of cancer cases we're expecting in 70 years, which is a much higher, much more difficult analytic benefit. And I don't think we see congressional offices doing the benefits analysis in the same way that we see the executive branches agencies. Uh, the, the other comment slash on to question is, I'm scared as a former desk officer to hear this commentary that we should judge the, out, the value of OIRA by the quality of an agency's benefit cost analyses. Um, <laughs> because when you have it for 30 days, you're the last person on the end of the budget. Some a famous uh, manager in OIRA described OIRA as the speed bump. Once in a while, you can take out a catalytic converter. Once in a while, <laughs> to, do it, to damage something. But you were never going to have the ability, resources, contract dollars to go back and fundamentally improve an analysis. And so I question whether it's this administration, the Obama administration. Again, I'm not very a partisan person. You know, we've seen a quality of decline, but I think that's really related to what the agencies are doing. Not so much. If we're going to really object to what the desk officers or wire is doing, we need to evaluate what the rulemaking came in at and what it came out as, and, and look at that as a function of wireless things. But I, what I really see is a de degradation over the decades of the principles of benefit cost analysis as it ties to it. We've learned a lot through National Academy of Sciences review. What we're seeing is agencies are not following their own guidance, whether it's EPA or HHS. We're not. They're not following a four. Uh, so where Congress could play a useful role would be sort of in the regulatory checkbook idea, which is did they do these things, do a checkmark audit of saying did they consider alternatives, did they objectify benefits, et cetera. That would be an auditing function, but the agencies themselves could do that, or IRA could do that. I think what we're seeing is a lack of adherence 
to agencies of their own uh, following their guidance as consistently, which I think leads the call to maybe the agency should self-regulate themselves through regulation. We know enough about how to do good risk assessment uh, objectively, whether it's the World Health Organization, whether it's OECD. We have really good standards on what is a good risk assessment, what is a good benefit analysis that we can hold agencies more accountable. So we have time for about a 30-second response if anybody has any thoughts in closing. Yeah, I, Sally? I had the pleasure of working with Jonathan, and I, I rarely disagree with him, and I agreed with virtually everything he said up until the end. Yes, GAO and CBO are not um, class acts at all times and certainly do not now have the capacity to do the kinds of things we would expect them to do. But if you give them a mission and you let them get staff and you get them geared up, it is, it is possible. And for me, it was the least of all evils. Uh, remember, I didn't like any of this stuff. I was in the do-nothing do camp and, and hoping that it would all straighten itself out. Um, but when you get to the self-regulation by the agencies, I, I think that would be a default that I would not be prepared to endorse. Um, I think they are much more subject to the winds of politicalization, to the pressures of the um, interest groups that um, they have authority with respect to, and that um, the dispassionate second opinion label that comes from OIRA review uh, has some benefit if not completely, but I want to go back in, in my last two seconds and say, I think that whether or not something is wrong is shown by the fact that uh, Chris says that the Obama CBAs and RIAs were undisciplined. Um, some were. Some were. Yeah. I think that the Trump CBAs are mostly sound. And then you have Stuart and, and me, some, some, saying the exact opposite. What's wrong with this picture? Or is this the picture we want to have? And does this spell out the elasticity that he spoke about um, in, in the beginning? Is there any restraint that is uh, worth commenting on? Well, Sally, you get the last word. Everybody, please take a look uh, for Stuart and Susan's papers on the website. Uh, but please join me in thanking the panelists. We'll take a short break until, I guess, a minute after 10.30, and we'll be back for our next panel, Cost-Benefit Analysis in the Courts.